For those of you who are new to this class, if you weren't here last week, uh, we're studying the book of Matthew um, and we're studying Matthew's perspective on who Jesus was. All right, so uh, every, you know, I talked about every um, gospel writer, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, each one of them had a different, you know, a different view of who Jesus was, depending on the audience that they were writing their gospel for. And so Matthew sees Jesus as the divine king. And if you follow that idea, all, you'll see that idea represented all the way through Matthew, the book of Matthew. Matthew writes about Jesus as the divine king. So uh, we reviewed the first instance in the book of Matthew where the gospel writer portrays Jesus as a royal or kingly figure. And that was at his birth when he was worshiped by the wise men from Babylon and presented gifts that represented his royal, not only his royal nature, his royal nature, his divine nature, and his sacrificial character. So the gold for his royal nature, uh, frankincense, the incense for his divine nature, a, a, a product, uh, something that was used in worship, and the myrrh, something that was used uh, usually for burial purposes uh, to demonstrate his sacrificial character. Okay, so Matthew keeps going in his description of Jesus' life with actually a, a kind of an unusual episode where Jesus is tempted by the devil. Boy, what, you know, think about that for a second. Jesus, the Son of God, tempted by the, uh, the devil. A lot of questions come up about that, and we'll talk about that in a moment. This event occurred immediately after Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist and confirmed as the divine Messiah by the appearance of the Holy Spirit and the voice of God. Uh, one of the only times where you see the Godhead represented, you know, the, the Son is there in His uh, incarnate uh, status as a man. The Holy Spirit is there as the dove appearing and the Father is there uh, with the voice speaking, this is my, this is my Son. And so you have the Trinity, you know, we, the, people say, oh, the word Trinity doesn't appear in the Bible. Well, it doesn't, but the concept of it does. And th uh, one of the most uh, uh, amazing uh, scenes is that particular um, uh, uh, presence, if you wish, of the Godhead at Jesus' uh, baptism. Well, um, this begins Jesus' public ministry. Uh, this begins Jesus' public ministry on a very lofty note, right? The Father in heaven speaking as Jesus is baptized, the dove appearing, very, very high note. But to balance out the view, we now see Jesus in the desert, hungry, thirsty, tired, and battling temptation. So in this scene, Matthew is able to show us that even though Jesus is king, he must still face the same attacks from the same opponents as we do. I mean, you know, if the Messiah came and he was treated as a king and he went you know, treated royally, never came close to any of the poor people, the people who had problems, you know, he lived his whole life as a king and then just simply you know, went back to heaven one day, I don't know if we would, he would be the Jesus we'd be talking to about our problems. So Matthew, early on in his gospel, demonstrates Jesus' very real uh, human, human nature. Of course, uh, as divine king, he's able to demonstrate his mastery over Satan and all of his temptations. So now this story about the temptation is also uh, told in Mark and also in Luke's gospel, but Matthew's description is the most complete. Okay? Uh, a reminder also on your, on your notes that you've got, your lesson notes, if you notice I've listed once again the reading schedule, the names of the lessons, the titles of the lessons, and also what I'd like for you to read in preparation for that lesson because I'm not going to always read all the material uh, in class, we don't have time. So let's take a look at verse one, chapter four. It says, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So Mark says that Jesus was impelled by the Spirit, led up there, that Greek word, another way to say that, impelled by the Spirit. It wasn't just a suggestion. 
It wasn't just, you know, what would be good now, I think, you know, I think maybe if you just went, to, you know, it wasn't that. He was impelled by the Spirit. Jesus said later on in His ministry that He only spoke and did what the Father told Him to speak and do, John uh, chapter 8, verse 28 and 29. So this is one of the things that the Father has told Him that He must do. Um, this guidance, as we see here, was provided through the agency of the Holy Spirit. So th this was no human desire. In other words, you know, to go into the desert to, fa to face treacherous temptations of Satan, this was not bravado, this was, not no, this was no survivor game. You know, we, we always have to understand when we're talking about Jesus, the two natures here, the divine nature, the human nature. And the human nature is human, really human. And so the human nature does not want to go into the desert for 40 days fast and you know, face all the, the trouble there. This was, a, this was a challenge. Human nature would have avoided a deadly confrontation with such an opponent so early in one's ministry. If Jesus was merely human, human nature would have capitalized on the great events at the baptism to start his ministry and, and, and you know, develop a strong following and greater strength and wisdom in ministry before going one-on-one -on -one with Satan. Because human nature always puts the difficult things further, right? We all do that. And we put the difficult things further down, further down the road. But Jesus' ministry was totally devoted to God and it was God's will that he uh, faced this test right away. And so without delay, Jesus goes into the desert immediately following his baptism. Again, a kind of an object lesson for us. Sometimes for a long period of time in our lives, Jesus or the Lord or God is kind of pointing us towards a challenge or a, a test you know, that we, we must do, that we must undertake in our character, in our lives, in our situation, whatever that is. And, and we, we, a lot of times you know, we push that back, not today. Today's not the day I'm tackling that issue. We keep pushing it back. Marvelous example here. You know, God says to Jesus, the Spirit impels him, you're going to have to face the test and you're going to have to face it right away. And so he goes. So let's look at verse two. It says, and after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. So Mark says that during these, in Mark's account, Mark says that these 40 days in the desert he was tempted by Satan and was with wild beasts. Now the way Matthew and Mark describe it, Jesus' experience in the desert was as follows. First of all, he fasted, no food for 40 days. Now since he had no weakness of the body or soul caused by sin, the Bible says that he only became hungry after 40 days. Remember, it's the sinfulness in our flesh that weakens us. Not only spiritually or emotionally, but it's the sin in our flesh that many times weakens us physically. But having no sin, uh, Jesus was, was strong and able to, to do this. He fasted. Secondly, he was with wild beasts. That's a little more difficult. Mark is the one who mentions this, and it would be a reference to animals or to continuous temptations that he had to endure. Now, the way the passage is written in Matthew suggests that he faced 40 days of continuous harassment from Satan and his allies, because this, you know, he was with the wild beasts, in many instances in the Bible, this doesn't simply refer to animals, but actually temptations. Paul the, the Apostle also mentions that he, Paul, had to battle wild beasts in Ephesus. And he didn't mean lions or dogs or stuff like that. He, he's talking about opponents of the gospel. He, he referred to them as wild beasts. So you, know, you can take it either way. But I would, uh, I would suggest that we're talking about a continuous spiritual harassment. Okay. Then, uh, in order of what takes place, he defeats Satan. At the end of the 40 days of fasting, he becomes hungry, and it's at this point that Satan himself attempts to destroy him. Now, there may have been other instances and encounters with the devil, but this is the one that is preserved and revealed to us. 
So we don't know about the 40 days and 40 nights. We don't know about what happened there. But we have this one episode to give us a, you know, a look into what may have taken place. And then the fourth thing that, takes, uh, that happens in this episode, he is minister, ministered to by angels. And I'll speak more about this later on, but for now, suffice to say that the Father provides for his needs through angels. So before we go on to Satan's three temptations, let's discuss the nature of these temptations with regards to Jesus. In the book of James, James describes the nature of temptation on an ordinary person. So let's look at that passage here. I've got it up on the slide there. James says, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then, when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. In this passage, James refers to the type of temptation that draws on a corresponding weakness in a person in order to seduce them into sin. Uh, for example, uh, alcohol for the alcoholic, right? drugs for the drug addict, whatever, you know, whatever that weakness is, or the opportunity to boast for one who has problems with pride, egotism, or pornography for the one who has the urge to lust. So James is saying there's something inside of you that Satan kind of is trying to, like a button, you know, you know we say they press your button, you know, there's something inside of you that you're trying to keep under control or whatever that, that corresponds to the temptation. Okay? So in one form, temptation is a seduction. A seduction. A luring into the trap of sin and then resulting in death by using or offering something or someone that corresponds to a forbidden desire within the individual. So when we talk about temptation in this way, we're talking about being seduced. You know, something inside of us is being called upon to, to come forward in disobedience in some way. Now when we're looking at Jesus' temptations, this was not the nature of Satan's temptations on Jesus, because the Bible teaches that God cannot be tempted by evil. James chapter 1, verse 13, and Jesus is God. So we have a, you know, we have a little difficulty here. The Bible's calling it a temptation, but the Bible also says that there's no sin in Jesus. So what is the corresponding thing? Well, we need to understand that the temptations that Jesus struggled with were tests. They were things done to examine and produce His true self. So if you take the word temptation and put that aside for a moment and you use the word test, that'd be a little more accurate, a test. You take a diamond, right, and you, you look at it through a, a little, uh, you know, a little uh, magnifying glass to examine it. This is the form of temptation that Jesus underwent. These were ways to reveal if there were any weaknesses or inconsistencies or any hypocrisies. For example, humans experience these kind of tests or temptations whenever we fill out a form or we write an exam or we suffer some, some sort of adversity, we're being tested. It's not an issue of morality, it's an issue of quality. And these things, these are tests or temptations that bring out our true character. So Satan's temptations towards Jesus, these were not allurements to Jesus' sinful nature. He was without sin, so there was nothing inside of him that he could correspond to, you know, to, to do something which was disobedient or immoral. Satan's temptations were tests to measure the claims and to measure the person of Jesus to see if he could discredit him or discourage him or distract him from his father's command to carry out his ministry 
on his behalf. Now those of you who are in my Genesis class, I want to, make a, I want to divert here, open a subfile just for a moment. Those of you who are in my Genesis class, you know we talk about the seed of promise, right? God promises Eve that one day from her seed there will there'll come someone who will crush Satan's head, right? So that's one of the early, I think uh, Marty spoke about this recently, or was it, uh, Marty did and so did Brother North at his lesson last Wednesday. Anyways, the idea is from the very beginning in Genesis, God promises to man that someone will come one day to, de to defeat Satan. And, and if you read the Bible, you can follow that thread, you know, the seed of promise, you can follow that thread all the way through Genesis, Exodus, you know, through the prophets, through the New Testament, all the way to the book of Revelation. That promised seed, of course, is Jesus Christ. Okay, so this here, this you know, test that we're talking about, Jesus' temptation, this thing, you can take it and you can put it into the story of the seeds. This is an attempt by Satan to derail, if you wish, or destroy or stop this seed of promise from eventually taking place. And it's quite um, spectacular, if you wish, you know, Jesus and Satan you know, in the desert, because now the seed of promise has come. Satan has not managed to block it or destroy it in the Old Testament despite the disobedience of the Israelites and wars and them being wiped out by pagan nations, somehow you know, the seed of promise, it, it, it stayed alive. And now Jesus is here. I mean, you know, Herod trying to kill all the babies. Another attempt by Satan to stop the seed of promise from being fulfilled. So now Jesus is here. I mean, he's here in person. And so now Satan confronts face to face. And the test is to see, are you really who you say you are? That's the test. It's not a temptation to make him lie or cheat or do something like that. So Satan had ruined the first Adam and now he would use his full force to try and stop Adam's savior, Jesus. So let's look at the temptations. Temptation number one basically is prove yourself. Prove yourself, verse three and four. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So on the surface, this seems like a reasonable request, right? If you're the son of God, then give me the kind of proof that only such a person could provide. Seems normal. The test here was to see if Jesus would rely on God's word for proof of this, or if he would need to exercise some form of power to confirm this fact. Now remember, before entering the desert, the Father said from heaven for everyone to hear, including Satan, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, Matthew 3.17. So, was God's word enough, or did Jesus need to supply more for himself or for others? So if Jesus provides the miracle, which he is perfectly capable of doing, he would be doing the same thing that the Jews did afterwards. The Jews were always relying on signs and wonders to prove God's word, rather than simply relying on the credibility of the word alone that God said something and for thousands of years had maintained them and, you know, and so on and so forth. That wasn't enough. They needed every generation. They needed more miracles. You know, to, so this was, the, this was the test. So Jesus' answer from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, is at once concise and all-encompassing. It's taken from Moses' summary exhortation to the Israelites before they entered the promised land. You need to understand when Moses said this to understand how it applies to Satan. They had been miraculously freed from Egyptian slavery, the Jews had. They had been miraculously sustained in the desert for 40 years with the bread of manna from heaven. Their clothes didn't wear out, their sandals didn't wear out, they weren't attacked by other people, they survived 
all of that time, an entire generation witnessed great miracles from God and yet Moses warns them that their lives were sustained by God's words, not the miracle. You know, you parents, you have the same idea with your children, right? You tell your children this is going to happen and then they come back and question you and so on and so forth or they disobey you and you have to exercise the punishment. Haven't you ever heard yourself say, didn't you hear what I said? Didn't you, didn't you think I was serious when I said you needed to be in by 11 o'clock, have the car in the driveway not a minute later than 11 and you showed up at 12.15? Didn't you hear what I said? Didn't you take my word for it? That's exactly what's happening here. In other words, the miracles served the word not the other way around. For example, God had promised in His word to Abraham and others that He would eventually give them the land. The miracle simply brought His word to its fulfillment. God told the Israelites that He would save and bless them and that word was the guarantee that it would happen, not the miracles. God's word declared that Jesus was the Son of God and that word was the absolute and final proof anybody needed for this to be established. Didn't need another miracle, he said so. So the test was to see if Jesus would go beyond the word of the Father. And Jesus quotes the very words of the Father that established the all-sufficiency of God's word. In other words, Jesus tells Satan, God's word says that I am, and that's enough proof. No more proof is necessary. God's word says so. And isn't that who we are? Isn't that who we used to be? The people of the book, the people of the word. We knew the word, we were trying to put the word into, you know, into practice in a simple and, and honest way. If God said it, you know, if God said do this, we did this. If God said don't do that, we didn't do that. So that was the first temptation. The first test. Test number two. Test number two, the first test was prove yourself. The second test is prove the word. Verses five to seven. It says, then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus said to him, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So Satan is unbowed, he's unrepentant after Jesus' response to his first attack. He merely follows it up with a subsequent play, this time based on the word of God himself. You know, he says, prove yourself. And, and Jesus says, well, the word of God proves who I am. That's enough. And then he says, oh yeah, well, prove the word. Just keeps coming back, right? So Satan says, prove the word in a way that would put Jesus' human life in danger. Now Josephus, a Jewish historian of the time, writes that there was a point on the exterior wall surrounding the temple near Solomon's porch where the drop from the top of the wall to the ravine below was 600 feet. It was a high wall and then you know, the way it's built, there's, there's a high wall and then there's a ravine that goes down and then you go down that ravine and you go up and on the other side is the Garden of Gethsemane and then if you keep going another couple of miles is Bethany. So from that top spot all the way to the bottom of the ravine, 600 feet. So Satan's suggestion was that if the word is your proof, then test it to see if what it says about you is true. You know, you're relying on the word. The word says that you know, if you get into trouble or whatever, it'll protect you. Let's test that. Now the passage uh, that Satan quotes is from Psalm 91, 11 and 12. And it refers to God's providential care of not only His divine Son, but also of all of His children of faith. God will protect us. 
The deception is not in misquoting the passage. He doesn't misquote this passage. The deception lies in using this passage to prove a false premise. And that happens a lot. People using scripture to prove something which is false. Uh, I think in today's generation, for example, uh, Elton John, pop singer, uh, gay rights activist, homosexual himself, uh, imagine they interview him to get information on what the Bible says about homosexuality. You know, they wouldn't actually ask somebody who actually knows the Bible or teaches the Bible, they ask Elton John. And Elton John says, well, the Bible says you shouldn't judge. And Jesus said that we should love. So he's quoting Jesus to prove a false premise that homosexuality is acceptable. So did he quote the Bible correctly? Yes, he did. But he quoted it to support a false idea. This is exactly what's taking place here. Satan is accurately quoting a passage of scripture, but he's doing so to prove a false, a false idea. Now the passage teaches that God uses extraordinary means, even angels, to care and protect for His children. Satan, however, uses this passage to support the idea that God will protect you and preserve you no matter what you do. Not the same thing, right? In response, Jesus correctly discerns Satan's intent and answers with a scripture that addresses the true issue. And the true issue is presumptuousness. We know what presumptuousness is. You know, if you say to someone, man, you've got a lot of gall, <laughs> you could also say, man, you're really presumptuous. His scripture reference does not contradict the scripture set forth by Satan. It actually explains it fully so that the meaning is clear. For example, yes, we're to trust God's promise to care for us, but to foolishly test His promise with careless actions or sinful actions is presumptuous and full of pride. This type of action is an attempt to force God to prove His promise, and in doing this, one shows a lack of trust and a very, very proud heart. The first test was to see if Jesus would provide a sign to prove Himself. The second test was to see if Jesus would ask the Father to provide a sign to prove His word. And in both responses, Jesus relies on the word and on its proper meaning to meet Satan's attacks. So that was temptation, that was temptations, uh, temptation number two. Let's look at temptation number three. Temptation number three is take the easy way. Take the easy way. And this was the most uh, treacherous of the temptations. Verse eight to 10, let's read that. It says, again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, go, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Now, in the first two tests, the issue rested on Jesus' divine nature and His relationship to the Father and His relationship to the Word of the Father. This third attempt appeals more to Jesus' human nature and His mission here as the Messiah, as the King. This is where our theme of Jesus as King really shines through in this passage. So Matthew has established Jesus' credentials as divine King with his description of the wise men worshiping Him and the gifts and so on and so forth. Here, Satan offers Jesus a position that the Lord already has. He's already king over all the kingdoms, but Satan offers him to be the king over all the kingdoms. He's already got that. Of course, Satan's deceit is evident in several ways. 
First of all, he falsely claims that all of the kingdoms have been given to him. Now we know that he rules in this world as a rebel leader in disobedience to God. The thing is, does he rule in this world? Yes, but it hasn't been given to him. There's the lie. He says, all these things have been given to me. Uh, uh, uh. No, he's taken over these things. He's in disobedience, he's a rebel. And he also falsely claims that he has the power to crown Jesus Lord over these. But of course we know he has no such power. So in suggesting that he will do this, if Jesus worship him, Satan is offering Jesus a crown without having to suffer a cross. There's the temptation, there's the test. Jesus is crowned Lord of all because of His victory over sin and death through His cross and through His resurrection. As Paul says in Philippians 3, he says, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things unto Himself. Satan falsely appeals to him to forego this route for the easier way of simply changing his allegiance. Jesus is crowned king of all through the cross. And Satan is saying to him, you know what, I can get you there a lot easier. Just change your allegiance. And isn't that what he says to us as well? Isn't that what he said to to Eve and to Adam, I'm going to give you something. But he offered them something they already had. Same, same, same thing, same thing with Jesus. And, and with us, right? Doesn't he offer us the easy way around? Because <laughs> Jesus is a, a, a kind of a template for the Christian life. You know, he, he had to go through the cross to to arrive at glory, and we also have to go through the cross to arrive at glory. Not the same cross as His, obviously, you know, we're not going to be taken by the government and you know, nailed on a piece of wood. You know. but, but if we wanted to and go around and talk to each person here, and if you, if you chose to be honest and open, you know, and open yourselves to everybody here, I think everybody could pretty well describe the cross that they feel they have to go through in order to arrive at that glory. Same, same thing. And Satan is always tempting us to forego that cross and take an easier route. And I think that's one of the great purposes that Jesus undertook by allowing Himself to be tempted like this. So Satan falsely appeals to him to forego this route, as I said, for the easier way of simply changing allegiance. Why suffer to become king? Worship me and you receive the same thing without the suffering. It was the same lie, as I mentioned, that made Adam and Eve fall. He said to them, you shall become like gods if you do as I say. They were already like God. They were already in the image of God. Of course, they wouldn't have and they didn't, they simply lost what they already had. So Jesus was king, a king with a mission from the Father. He answered the way that Adam and Eve should have responded, be gone Satan. Jesus for the first time addresses the devil and rebukes him openly. His command is such for two reasons. First, he has exhausted his temptations and he has lost. It's time for him to go. And secondly, he has offered the worst temptation of all, to deny God, to break the first commandment by denying the Father. Terrible. In Jesus' case, this would be to try and achieve his mission by denying the Father's plan of salvation. The Father is the one that came up with the plan. The Son is the one that was going to execute the plan. The Holy Spirit is the one that would empower the Son to execute the plan. Satan was saying, you know, let's derail this thing. So the test was to see if Jesus would carry out the Father's plan, which was death on the cross to gain forgiveness for men, or Satan's plan, worship Satan and gain rulership. 
in his reply, Jesus not only vanquishes the devil and his schemes, but he also guarantees the salvation of all those who will hope, whose hope rather will rest upon him and his sacrifice. So let's look at the last verse 11. It says, then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. So Matthew describes angels ministering to the Lord, to the king. Their assistance would have been to provide food and sustenance. Remember I told you, he's a man, he needs to eat. Their assistance would be to return him to his home and also to celebrate and rejoice with him this great and decisive spiritual battle. I ask you this question, who else is he going to celebrate with? Who else is he going to celebrate with? He doesn't have the apostles yet, his parents, his brothers. And so the angels who recognize who he is, celebrates. And isn't it wonderful the celebration that you experience when you've overcome, when you've gone into the desert and then the, that period of desert is over and you look back and say to yourself, I made it through and I didn't let go and I didn't deny and I stood firm. So Satan continued to attack Jesus through others eventually causing his death, but his own power was tested and defeated once for all at this critical point in Jesus' ministry. Okay, two lessons and the lesson is over. Two lessons uh, that I've kind of developed from this. Lesson number one, Jesus is king of the spiritual world. In the description of the wise men's appearance, Matthew establishes Jesus as a royal figure recognized by worldly leaders, whether they are friendly like the Magi or his enemies like Herod. They both recognized his royal nature. Here in this scene, the temptation scene, he shows that Jesus is also king or ruler of the spiritual world as well. He defeats Satan, the supreme spiritual enemy, and he is served by angels, the supreme spiritual ministers. He's the king of the spiritual world, either way, he rules. And then the second lesson we can draw, the word of God does save. It is through the word that we come to save our souls, isn't it? Romans chapter 1, 16, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, the word of God, that's what saves us. Not miracles, not big rallies, not jumping around, that, that's not what saves us. It is also through the word of God that we remain saved. 2 Timothy 3.16, every scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, rebuking, uh, reproving, for training, right? The word of God. And knowing the word and knowing it in context and using it and applying it properly will keep our spiritual lives healthy and safe from the many temptations of the evil one. And I say one more comment before we close down. The purpose of our teaching and preaching and daily Bible reading and so on and so forth is to keep our souls strong and safe through the knowledge of God's word. Because when we're tempted many times, you know, we, we fall to it simply because we don't know the word enough. It's not embedded in our hearts. It's not embedded in our minds. You know, that's the encouragement to study, to come to class, to develop your own personal Bible reading habits because you need the knowledge of the word to fight the, the battle, uh, the spiritual battles that you, uh, that you face. Okay, so there's Jesus' temptation. Next week we'll continue uh, the kingdom character. We're going to talk about the king's character, all right? That's it, thank you very much.